Juno World Affairs Council presents North Korea, bellicose tweets, and other nuclear challenges we face with Philip Yun. Yun is the executive director of the Plowshares Fund, a nonprofit that works to eliminate the dangers of nuclear weapons. Yun previously worked on U.S. North Korea diplomacy in the State Department during the Clinton administration. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to be here um, and to listen to some of the ruminations and remarks that I have uh, about uh, nonproliferation, but specifically North Korea. Uh, first, let me just say this is, um, I'm just thrilled to be here in Juneau. Um, I want to thank a longtime supporter, Judith Mayer, for bringing me here. Um, I have to say that I've spent a lot of time um, this, this morning and yesterday at, at some of your high schools. And I spent a lot of time with probably some of your kids or grandkids. And I've been incredibly impressed with their sense of um, um, social activism and the desire to learn about how we can make this place, you know, uh, make this, our world a better place. And if I have to say anything about Plowshares Fund, our mission is to um, eliminate the threat uh, and reduce the threat of nuclear weapons. That's to make our world better. And I felt like it was, I felt so good to see uh, our future generation um, having that sense instilled in them so early. So I have, a, I have a lot of hope, and that's the one thing, one of many things, that I, great things I'm going to be taking away from my trip here in Juneau. So thank you very much to you for, for what you have done um, with your kids and, and what I've been able to see. Uh, so as an introduction, let me just say, as, I, as the intro, I'm the executive director of Plowshares Fund. And, and again, focusing on reducing and eliminate the threats of nuclear weapons. We've been around for 36 years, and we give away something like 6 or $7 million to do that. I'd like to think that we're quite effective. We've been written up in a number of places about how effective we are. In fact, I think Philanthropy, Inside Philanthropy Magazine talked about us being uh, the most valuable um, uh, small funder uh, of 2017, which we're very proud of. In terms of my background, you also heard that I was at the State Department. Um, what the intro didn't talk about is the fact that I'm Korean American. My parents, uh, my mother is born in what is now North Korea, and my father is born in what is now South Korea. And so this whole notion of the Korean Peninsula has been a very big part of my uh, personal and professional life. So it's always a great opportunity um, to talk about what's going on on the peninsula. I also wanted to say that when people find out about Plowshares Fund, when they find out about State Department in North Korea, and they find out about <clears throat> me being a Korean American, they're always asking me about North Korea. And one of the things that I've found out, or I've realized, or it just has hit me really in the last six months is how worried people are. Um, I think it's, it's palpable. I've had friends uh, from all over the country give me a call and say, should I be worried? Right? Um, in ways that had never happened before. And I think that I realized that um, when I talk with them, we're kind of worried about different things, which I found quite interesting. And as an example, let me bring something in that sort of will hit home for all of us in different ways, and that's the false alarm that happened in Hawaii recently. So <clears throat> I, I understand there was a tsunami threat uh, as well. So I, you know, just that's why I think there's a connection here. Um, can you imagine what it was like when people got on their phones this, quote, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, <clears throat> seek immediate shelter. This is not a drill. So for 38 minutes, the residents of Honolulu thought there was an ICBM on their way. Now, you know, people are talking about the surprise, the terror that is apparent in all of this. Um, but what had me thinking was that uh, We've had some time to think about what this also meant. I think this is a great illustration of what I was talking about before. Many people were worried about actually North Korea willy-nilly, just out of the blue, sending a nuclear weapon to Hawaii or hitting the United States. Um, and as I will talk about before, I don't think um, you know, that's a concern. There's no question about that. But I think it's a very, very small concern. What I ended up worrying about more than anything else and what was an illustration for me was that um, the real problem, or what this illustrated, was the problem of mistake or error. So here in Hawaii, we had a simple error. 
but you know, what happens if the person who pressed that button was actually mentally unstable? What happens if there was a computer malfunction? Our, our computers break down all the time, they crash. What happens if it's a computer hack by an individual or for, uh, from a, um, a hostile government, which we know some hostile governments are very much into hacking these days. So if that had been also the other question is what had happened if it had been not the state system of Hawaii, but had been the national system of the United States? In that circumstance, I don't know if people understand that in that circumstance, if there was a, uh, an alarm like that, the President of the United States would have 10 minutes, 10 minutes to decide whether to launch one weapon in response or 1,000. And if he'd launched 1,000, some figure is like 18,000 Hiroshima's. Um, he has the authority to launch just on that basis. So that is what the time pressures we're talking about. And when you mix that with mistake and you mix it with nuclear weapons, the result can be catastrophic. So what I thought what we would do is talk about this kind of situation in, in, about in the case of North Korea. So what I've laid out for you is something that's quite serious, and it should be serious. But the one thing I want to emphasize with you is that, in fact, we can do something about it. And I hope that in the later question and answer, we can talk a little bit about the things that we can do that we have control of, and to realize that the things that I'm most worried about, which is mistake, accident, um, is something that we can at least, that we have the ability to remedy, and we at Plowshares Funds are working towards that. So let me say <clears throat> what I would want to do with our talk here in the few minutes that we have is I want to talk about the current situation that we find ourselves with North Korea diplomatically and sort of what everyone's asking me. So what can North Korea actually do? I also am on the media a fair amount. Um, and every single time I am on the media, they ask me two questions. The first question is, what's the real threat? And why is North Korea doing what it's doing? So I will answer those questions. And then finally, what I will do is talk about um, what I think North Korea is going to be doing in the future, sort of not a strategic level, but tactically what we can expect. And then we'll close and we can sort of open it up for all kinds of questions. Is that okay for folks? Okay, all right. So where are we right now? Um, the current situation diplomatically you've heard about, we're in a peace initiative. North and South Korea, after many years, are finally talking with each other. That's a great, that's great news, great sign. The Olympics that are gonna be in Pyeongchang and South Korea are now being called the Peace Olympics. And so we have a breakthrough. After all this tension, everybody is breathing a sigh of relief. Everything is great. Um, and now North Korea is sort of, sort of in the back burner. Well, let me tell you, with North Korea, I've never gotten too high and I've never gotten too low. Because what, it's, what is possibly, uh, the possibilities are, and the most critical thing that you need to look for is what's the follow-up? What is gonna be done afterward? And what has to happen, in my view, is that there's got to be some kind of agreement or understanding that North Korea and the United States are going to start talking. If they don't talk, what's going to happen is that the United States will resume its military exercises, which have yearly been a source of tension, but last year, in 2017, was a source of huge tension. And what we're going to be is we're going to find ourselves exactly where we were uh, last year when tensions were rising, but only maybe a couple months delayed. So that's my prediction if we don't figure out a way for the United States and North Korea to talk. And what you will probably see at some point is an escalation, again, of more missile tests and probably more nuclear tests. So I'm on tape right now, uh, on TV, predicting that if the United States and, South, and, the United States and, and North Korea don't start some kind of dialogue. Um, where are we on the missile? and the nuclear uh, uh, programs. Well, let me put it this way. If we continue the policy that we have been doing, the international community in the United States in particular, which is a policy of sanctions, pressure, uh, and um, one that uh, relies on that, and one of sanctions, without talks, North Korea will, at some point in the next five to 10 years, have a small nuclear arsenal that is, in fact, actually capable of hitting the United States. Um, 
probably five years, given the amount of testing that's going on by, by the North Koreans, which is huge. To give you some perspective, uh, under the grand, just the missile side, the, grandson, uh, the grandfather, the founder, Kim Il-sung, something like uh, six, seven tests, five, you know, not that many. The, grand, the, the, the father, Kim Jong-il, uh, during his 17-year reign, I think it was, uh, 46 tests. And the grandson, in five, six years, has done over 100 tests, missile tests. Right? So that's what we're talking about here. So, uh, so we've got to do something. So this is the fact. These are the facts. North Korea is producing one nuclear weapons worth of material every eight weeks. Every eight weeks, they are adding one more nuclear weapons worth of material. That is something the size of a softball, either made of plutonium or highly enriched uranium. That's the thing that makes the, we the weapon go boom. Um, the sixth test, which was done uh, several, about five or six months ago in September, was likely a thermonuclear weapon. And it was something like uh, 17 times the uh, explosion uh, power of Hiroshima. 17 times. Hiroshima had something like 15 kilotons um, of uh, explosion. And, the, um, uh, and this one, we believe, was something like 250 kilotons. Now, if you recall, the fifth test that North Korea did, just to show their progress, they did a nuclear test, um, which we believe was something like, uh, and then the, the subsequent one. So one year, they did, did an explosion, um, this last test, that was 12 to 15 times greater than what it was. So they're progressing. I mean, that's a serious, serious improvement. In terms of the missile capability, which is important because once you have a, uh, a nuclear device, the whole idea is trying to figure out how to deliver it. Um, and one way is to do missiles. And as we know, North Korea has, um, as I said, has done 100 tests over the last five years. And what they're doing is parallel paths, which is devoted to liquid fuel, solid fuel, sea-based, fixed, and mobile. What does that all mean? Essentially, what that all means is that the notion that you're being hearing in the, in, the, in the news is a unilateral strike to take out these missiles or to do it before they launch these things. The reason why North Korea is doing this and gaining this capability is basically to say, we can move these in different places. Okay, and because solid fuel is easier to load and, can, and, and is more reliable, they can go anywhere. And so part of what you're going to be seeing and a theme that you'll hear is that North Koreans know exactly what they're doing and why, and they're demonstrating certain kinds of capabilities. The tests that they have been doing have been in different locations, and they're, so, they're telling the United States and others, yeah, you can say you're going to try to take it out, but we don't, you don't know where they are, and we're showing you you're not going to be able to do it. So that's the current state. And again, the big picture is they will have this capability. Um, there's some debate as to whether they have it right now. That, to me, doesn't really make any difference. If we continue what we're doing, they're going to be, they will have that capability. And then there are things that we're going to have to deal with at that point. So what is the real danger? I alluded to that before. The real danger and the real threat, in my mind, is not a preemptive nuclear strike by North Korea on the United States just willy-nilly. The only time that will happen, and this is something to think about, is if uh, North Korea um, preemptive, I mean, it feels threatened. And by the way, um, one of the things I forgot to do, can we put something on the screen here? Put that one thing on the screen. I forgot. Every single time I do a talk on North Korea, I sort of allude to this. So this is a photo of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea is basically blacked out. And where you see that one dot um, is Pyongyang. The rest is South Korea. And this is North Korea. This is the Korean Peninsula at night. It's a metaphor. Keep that in the back of your mind as we talk about a lot of things that are happening here. OK, so preemptive nuclear strike is not the real threat in my mind. And the reason is because a lot of people, you will not hear a lot of this on, on, uh, on, on the media and written about. But it's really important to remember. It's that deterrence on the Korean Peninsula and deterrence is alive and well. Um, I wrote an article um, in the LA Times op-ed over the summer. It says, why are we afraid of North Korea? Well, you know what? North Korea um, is not crazy. And I'll, we'll talk about that. Not suicidal. They know, they know fully that if they attack the United States, they would cease to exist. So you know, it's not an ideal situation. But that's what the whole point of deterrence is. 
North Korea knows that if it attacked us unilaterally with no provocation whatsoever, then you know, just if they attacked us, they would cease to exist. So um, that's something that is lost, has been lost in this whole conversation. Um, I'll tell you what I am worried about, though. And what I'm worried about, as I alluded to, as the, the, um, the Hawaii uh, situation um, illustrates, is miscalculation or mistake. Right now in the Korean Peninsula, you have an incredible number of military assets on uh, there. You have something like 450,000 South Korean troops. You have 30,000 US troops. You have on the north side, 1.1 million army. You have Chinese troops. You have US troops in Japan, about 50,000. And every year, they have military exercises with assets that they use. Now, think about this. That in and of itself is by itself, is, 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 is alarming um, and something to be very careful about that somehow they don't clash with each other. But in a, think about a situation of high tension. What happens if there is a firefight exchange of fire over the demilitarized zone that separates North and South Korea, which we just recently heard about. Someone was trying to escape. That's happened. What if there is an exchange of fire between naval vessels in the East Sea or the West Sea of the peninsula over fishing vessels? That has happened. What happens if a nuclear, I mean, a, uh, one of these missile tests that North Korea has done, whether it's over Japan or in the sea, somehow goes off course, is not able to self-destruct, and hits something or someone. And in each of these cases, you know, it's, it's hard enough as itself. But again, in this rising tension, you can see where this could escalate and people have to react. And it could quickly get out of control. That's what I'm worried about. Now, let's just add one more dimension that is new to this. So Kim Jong-un is. Uh, if you characterize him from what we know, relatively inexperienced, very aggressive, likes to be uh, unpredictable, and is very surprising. Does that sound familiar in other ways? <laughs> Regardless of what your politics are, um, I would argue that Donald Trump is very similar. Now think about that. You have two sides that mirror each other, not mirror each other, they're the same type. You add nuclear weapons to the mix and high tensions on the Korean Peninsula, um, that's a recipe for a disaster. And not because anyone wants to do anything, it's just, it just happens. It's this whole notion of stumbling into something that you don't want to do. So keep that in mind. What are North Korea's strategic motivations? Why is North Korea doing what it's doing? And again, that's the question I'm asked a lot. So I think most people who know North Korea, um, if there is, there's a lot of disagreement, but most will agree that uh, the, the overarching strategic um, objective of the North Korean regime is regime survival. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. And out of those objectives, in order to attain regime survival, there are three things I believe, based on my conversations and negotiations with them, that North Korea feels that it needs to achieve in order to make sure that they survive. The first one is this notion of self-defense. They want to prevent themselves from being intimidated, and they can protect the homeland, just like, just like the United States. Second, there's this notion of what I call preserving the national myth and the legitimacy of the regime itself. The regime, and North, uh, the regime itself has built itself on a certain kind of ideology, certain kind of prestige and honor. And um, for them to stay in power and to be viewed as legitimate, that's something that they have to promote and make the North Koreans feel good about themselves. And the third is essentially economic. And that's a relatively new factor, because um, what happened is that economics seemed to always take the, a back seat. But what happened is that Kim Jong-un's, the grandson's first speech publicly, he talked about economics directly. He said during the speech that he recognized in a very rare moment that uh, self-criticism of the government that, they, that the North Korean people had suffered for a very, very long time with famine because of the need of security. 
And he said specifically that the, what was the words, that the North Korean people need not suffer anymore. So he put himself on the hook to make their economic lives better. So those are the three things that you have, that North Korea has to accomplish. So my argument, again, and I think this is an indication that the North Koreans are not crazy, they're not stupid, they're very rational, logical. Nuclear weapons supports all three of those goals. All three of them. How is that? Well, in the case of self-defense, North Korea, um, nuclear weapons are the poor man, poor country's weapon. I've been to North Korea. I've seen their military. I've seen, you know, they're malnutrition. They can't feed themselves. Some of their uh, armaments are very old. They, they have to prioritize where they put their resources. So nuclear weapons are the most bang for the buck. And when I was in negotiations with them, the North Koreans specifically said to us, if Slobodan Milosevic of Yugoslavia had had a nuclear weapon, he'd still be in power now. If Saddam Hussein in 1991 and subsequently had had a nuclear weapon, he'd still be in power. And then when I got out of government, they said, if Muammar Gaddafi of Libya had had a nuclear weapon, he'd still be in power as well. And you know, I can't necessarily argue with them. So for them, nuclear weapons is a way to make sure that the small country that is North Korea, that is surrounded by very powerful states, okay, much more powerful than they, can somehow stay, be protected and feel um, somewhat safe in their own environment. Second thing is preserving a national myth. Well, how can I describe this? Well, North Korea has had a several, you know, during the 1990s and 2000s, had very bad years. Significant amount of starvation. They think, you know, hundreds of thousands, not millions of people had died because of not being able to feed themselves. They suffered a lot. And in many cases, North Korea, um, when they go to the uh, international are kind of laughing stocks for various reasons. They're tired of that. It grates at them. So what happens is that there are not many states that have nuclear weapons, nine states. And South Korea, North Korea's bitter rival, does not have a nuclear weapons capability. And so what the, the North Korean government can say to its people is, hey, we are the same as the United States, Russia, China. We are equal. They have to respect us and cannot dismiss us. And, and because the North Korean government has put so much money, literally blood, sweat, tears, and treasure into developing this type of capability, it is very hard for them to say, ah, don't worry about it, get rid of it. And again, it's a way for them to preserve for the North Korean people to feel good about themselves, that they have accomplished something that very few countries, other countries have. And finally, there's economic. Economic um, is that if they get enough security or firepower, they can then concentrate on the economics. So it's this notion, of, I have this picture in mind. Um, it's a picture of a volcano uh, with lava flowing all around. Um, and there is a cherry tree, cherry tree that is growing full bloom um, on this mountain thriving. So the way I, that's a metaphor in a sense for what the North Koreans are trying to do um, is that if they have protection security, they can devote uh, their, their uh, resources to the economic. And there's precedent for that. At the end of World War II, the United States basically said to East Asia, don't worry about your security. We'll take care of it. You just concentrate your, most of your resources into the economic. Okay, because otherwise, you know, we were afraid that they were going to become communist countries. And sure enough, and again, I'm generalizing just sort of as a, you know, there are all these nuances, but essentially that's what happened. And so as a result, the East Economic uh, Asia was able to get its resources together that you had Japan become an economic powerhouse, South Korea, you had uh, Singapore, you had Taiwan, all these countries didn't have to worry for their security or develop more than they would have otherwise. China, another example is China. In the late 1970s, they decided, Deng Xiaoping decided that they had to do economic reform. He had a lot of assets going into the military that were wasteful. And he said, well, we have nuclear weapons. We have an army. We can protect ourselves. So he started funneling a lot of economic money into the economy. And lo and behold, you see the Chinese miracle. So 
Here is an argument for, uh, I believe, a very good argument to say all three of those things that I just talked about, security, prestige, legitimacy, as well as economic, nuclear weapons support all three of those. That's how they look at it. Whether we agree with it or not, that's how they look at it. And I would argue to you that it's incredibly rational, it's incredibly logical, and it makes sense if you look at it in that way. So let me then say, I've talked about, uh, let, let's talk then going, why are they doing what they're doing now? And so I gave you the strategic reasons for why they're approaching certain things, the reason why they want nuclear weapons. So let's talk about what they've done over the last year or so and, and, um, and how to put it in a different frame for you all. Um, so I would say that North Koreans are doing a third kind of test. And what do I mean by that? I'm not talking about missile tests. I am not talking about nuclear tests. There's another testing that is happening that North Korea always does. And it's now testing the Trump administration. Now again, there's precedent for this as well. Back in 2011, 2012, what you had, 2012 in Asia was a very interesting time. What you had during that period of time was a new government changeover in South Korea, a new government in China, Jiang Xiaoping formally became president, a new prime minister in Japan, a new president in Taiwan, new president in Russia. You had a change of administration in the United States, second term of Obama, so Secretary of State, now Security Advisor, Secretary of Defense, all changed over during 2012. So North Korea was saying, huh, this is an interesting opportunity. I'm not going to wait for all these guys to get settled into their office, sort of figure out what we want to do, and they all want to talk about North Korea. They get together and figure out a solution to work with North Korea. This is an opportunity. So let's see what these guys are going to do. So what they ended up doing was testing missiles, two missiles, and they did a nuclear test all in the middle of this to see what was going to happen. So let's fast forward. So if they're testing, and so for me, this is a proof of their rationality and, and quite frankly, of their savvy. So what this past year and what will happen in the next year or so is basically several rounds of what is a multi-round standoff. And what I mean by that, the tension, I can kind of bracket tensions that we've had in the last year. We had tensions in the February, March, April period Okay, where we had the initial tweets that Donald Trump is tweeting. Oh my God, what does this mean, right? Um, they learned something from that. Um, and then there were, it ended with a military uh, parade in April. Everyone breathed a sigh of relief. There's no nuclear tests that people thought were going. In July and August, if you recall, North Korea shot two ICBMs. One on 4th of July, which was planned. They want to do it on our, on our holiday. And they did it at the end of um, July. You had a lot of escalation that was going on. The, the North Koreans knew, the, the United States decided to send um, B, uh, uh, B-1 bombers um, and stealth bombers from Guam to the United States during a period of time, uh, I think three month period, there were like 11 or 12 runs where they fly from there, go there. That's why Guam came up, because the, the North Koreans say, hey, you want to escalate with these bombers? Okay, we can escalate too. So what do they do? They said, we're, we've got a plan to attack Guam. That's why Guam came up. And then they said, we will escalate even more. And again, this is, there's a theater here, Kabuki. The military went up and said, here's a plan to attack Guam, Ms. Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un graciously picks it up. He, and then there's speculation. Is he, what is he going to do? Well, Kim Jong-un, what does he do? He says, ah, oh, this is a nice plan. I'm going to wait for the United States to do it. So he steps to the edge and comes back again. Third round. You had where he did a test over Japan, um, and then he had the, new six, the six nuclear tests, and then another test over Japan. Then you had fire and fury of the U UN, all this stuff about doing an ICBM, you know, across open air tests, all this stuff happening. And then suddenly it got diverted with all the, was it the hurricane, um, and, and, and so it, it went off sort of the, the, uh, um, uh, off the radar and uh, there was talk about some kind of negotiation that was going on. 
And then North Korea, for 13, um, I think it was for two months, didn't do a missile test for a while after that. And everyone said, oh, they're doing Then suddenly do this big ICBM, which is the biggest one that is capable of traveling with we don't know what kind of payload, because that depends on, um, you know, that's capable of hitting of Washington, D.C. And then the fourth round, think about this. They go the opposite direction. Suddenly, in January 1st, Kim Jong-un does a New Year's address and said, we want to do the Pyongyang Olympics. Everyone goes, huh, you know, wow, that's interesting. And suddenly we have a peace initiative. All this huge tension. So again, what I see is Kim Jong-un and the North Koreans poking, prodding. How are they going to react? Each time they do that, they're going to learn something more. Um, and so the, all of what I'm describing here is what I, what I see as classic North Korean behavior. And this behavior is a provocation. They are in control. They are being proactive. They do something. We then respond, exchange of harsh rhetoric. We go to the UN where there's condemnations. We escalate. They escalate more. We do sanctions, all right? Then there's media hype. There's so much media hype. I get called, and there's these questions. Are they going to attack us? Are we going to do a unilateral strike? There's this breathlessness, media breathlessness. And then something happens to reduce the tensions dramatically. <coughs> Pops a bubble, and then everyone says, oh, everything's OK. They forget about what they were worried about to begin with. You know, I'm exaggerating, but to illustrate the point. And then both sides can claim victory. Donald Trump says, hey, my intimidation worked. And then Kim Jong-un says, yeah, OK. But we got what we wanted. And to illustrate this, here in the United States, when all this was happening, especially, let's say, over the summer, where there was talk about, are they going to attack Guam, and all this sort of churning that was happening. In North Korea, from friends that I was talking about, daily life did not change at all. They were not warned that an attack was coming. They weren't worried about it at all. So that shows to me that there is this probing and what I'm saying, the upshot of this, is that um, you should expect more of this. And the danger out of all this is that if the United States and, and North Korea cannot talk and do not speak, uh, try to have this negotiation, then what you will have is more missile tests, um, more provocative acts. And each time, the more times and opportunities you do this, each round, there's always a risk of a miscalculation or a mistake. Okay. And one of the things that I will say, that if you do look at the data, uh, that each time we are engaged with North Korea in a dialogue, government to government, the number of provocations go down. So yes, North Korea on the missile side has moved very quickly, much more quickly than anybody imagined. But during that period of time, there's no conversations between the United States and North Korea, really. And so if you're going to do 100 missile tests in five years, yeah, you're going to progress very, very quickly. Prior to that, North Korea only did one or two tests over a 10-year period. You're not going to get very far that way. And so my point is that um, you know, to reduce the first thing, you know, so uh, this is where, again, North Korea is doing this probing and poking. And one of the things I think about is, the only American that has met Kim Jong-un that I know of and has spoke to him is Dennis Rodman. <laughs> I think we got to do a little bit better than that. <laughs> All right. So let me end uh, with my final point, and we'll open it up for questions. Um, well, uh, you know, so we at Plowshares Fund are working very hard for, to work on these solutions. Um, and what we're focusing on is reducing tensions to prevent the worst from happening. And we think we can do that. There are a lot of things that we can be doing, which is promoting talks, which we uh, are doing with some of our people that we give money to who are talking with the North Koreans to find out what they want. We talked with the Koreans 15 year, North Koreans 15 years ago. We had a sense of what they want. We haven't I have no idea what they want these days, all right, at a very official level. I get conflicting information. You've got to have it one-to-one -one so you know, because things change all the time, OK? Um, we want, so we want to prevent the worst from happening. Um, we want to prevent them from actually perfecting this ICBM capability. All right, I think understand why the military for purposes have to assume worst case. My guess is that they don't have this perfected right now. That's okay too. They could, but they have a deterrent. Let's just prevent them from, 
knowing for sure. And therefore, I think we then have a capability of having working out some kind of settlement. Over the, settlement. Over the short term, there's no way North Korea is going to give these things up. No way. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that a military strike, military use of military is not an option. Hundreds of thousands of people would die. We just, for various reasons, it just cannot happen. You know, it makes no sense. Unilateral strike has a very good chance of escalating very quickly. So um, the reality right now is we don't want to accept North Korea having this capability of having a large nuclear, ar I mean, a, a smaller nuclear arsenal. They're not going to capitulate, all right? We have to somehow work in between here where we stop them from getting better and we prevent the worst from happening. So let me give you my last point. The reason why I'm here and I'm uh, I, uh, in, in Juneau is to talk with people, to be, do my part, to make sure that people really see North Korea, um, um, Koreans as they are. Um, there's a, there's a um, you know, you have to know your, uh, you know, the, what is it, the saying, know your adversary like thyself. I cannot emphasize how important that is because that impacts the policies that you all, that are going to be implemented in different ways. So let me end with the story that illustrates that particular point as to how important it is. I think Americans, for the most part, look at North Korea through stereotypes. Again, they look at North Korea not as, as, as they are, but how we wish them to be, because sometimes we need a boogeyman, or how um, they actually are uh, uh, behaving. Um, it's always human nature to project your own sort of fears onto people. So when I was, a young, when I was at the State Department, um, why don't we put that photo up? OK. So when I was at the State Department um, and things were better, and I can answer, I do think that we were very close to a deal back in 2000 with the North Koreans. And for a variety of reasons, it didn't happen. Very close. So uh, during that period of time where th relations were going up, North Korea decided to respond to, a, to President Clinton sending my former boss, Secretary of Defense William Perry, to North Korea, send his number two guy, uh, Jo myung nuk who's that general right there, to Washington to have talks with Hillary Clinton, I'm not Hillary, uh, Madeleine Albright, then Secretary of State. So I was sent from, uh, Washington, from Washington to meet them in San Francisco and then bring them to Washington for these talks and to meet with President Clinton. Um, that was to set the stage for hopefully a, a big deal that we were going to try to put together. So we meet um, uh, with the North Korean delegation at the State Department, and we're all sitting at long tables on both sides. And I remember we started these opening statements, and the um, Jo myung nuk does a timeout kind of thing, and he wants to talk to the side, which is fairly common in these kinds of negotiations. And my understanding from all this was he wanted to know when is he going to meet with President Clinton. Interesting. His schedule did not have President Clinton on there, but he was, it was very important to him that he meet with President Clinton. Um, and I think there was some fear that we would basically bait and switch and it wouldn't happen. So it's very focused on that, and we had to um, assure him that the meeting was going to occur. There's a lot of political criticism about this particular visit, understandably so. Well, the meeting was scheduled with President Clinton. Um, we told him, and right before that, he said, I need to go to my hotel. So he goes to his hotel, and then I get a phone call uh, from someone, I don't know who it was, and said, oh, hey, you won't believe this, but he changed his clothes. I said, what? Well, what happened was when we were meeting at the State Department, he had a suit and a tie, civilian clothes. When he went to meet President Clinton, he dressed in his full dress military garb. And that is a photo that was published at the New York Times. This is their photo above the fold. Um, and the reaction by most of the folks in Washington was like, oh, crazy North Korean wearing a full dress military uniform to meet the President of the United States. You know, this is so provocative, et cetera, et cetera. And that's natural. Well, when I saw this photo, I clapped my hands and I said, this is great. And why is that? This photo was not for American consumption. This photo was for North Korean consumption. And sure enough, this photo was published 
everywhere in North Korea. And what was it meaning? What was the meaning of this? I was so happy because it meant to me that there was going to be progress. And why was it? This Cho myung nuk during his meeting, basically said to President Clinton, OK, now remember, this guy is head of the army, of the military, the vanguard, the protector of North Korea against the United States, which has been in has, that North Korea has said, the United States has been the reason for all your suffering. They are responsible for the splitting of, of Korean Peninsula, the Korean Peninsula, etc. The United States is completely evil. That's what they've been led to believe. And then suddenly this guy says, the United States and North Korea need not be enemies forever. And this is also published. So what is that saying? Well, we know dictatorships, you know, they're like all other bureaucracies. They can't change on a dime. It's like a big ship. You've got to start steering it, and you've got to say, people, where the, where's the direction? And so therefore, what he was saying here is, folks, with this photo, times are changing. And you better get ready for it. All right, so why am I telling this story? To illustrate the point that here we are, same fact, this photo. Two different, entirely different interpretations and a result, two entirely different policy um, recommendations or options that you would pursue as a result of that. So I ask you, who's right? Uh, OK, I'll just oh, leave it at that. So finally, let me end with that. Perceptions matter. OK, knowing who your adversary are man, ma matters. Because as I said at the opening, the president has the ability to um, unleash 1, 000, 1 to 1,000 nuclear weapons on a moment's notice. And I also am leaving you that mistakes happen. And so while this is depressing, um, as I said, we at Plowshares Fund, and that's our ethos, we believe we can all make a difference. And if you look at what we did, have done with respect to um, uh, reduction of nuclear weapons, the number of them, what we did with the Iran deal, we're hoping to do with North Korea to have an impact to try to reduce the chances that a nuclear weapon um, will be used in, um, by accident, uh, miscalculation, or madness. So thank you very much for taking the time to be here this afternoon um, to listen to some of my musings about what's going on in North Korea. And um, I'd be more than happy to take questions. I especially appreciated your comments about the highest risk being miscalculation and, and then your narrative about uh, looking at the past year as an example, the strategic steps um, uh, leading to the peace initiative in January 1st. Um, is it your sense that the Trump administration appreciates the same uh, testing in the sense that um, at least some pundits uh, that are supportive of him have attributed uh, North Korea's decision uh, to work with South Korea right now as a direct result of his being tough. Um, so that you actually, again, uh, picking up on your comment about having two different world uh, perspectives about what drives us, um, the one side, uh, if Trump and his administration believes that uh, the real way to counter uh, North Korea is to be as unpredictable, yeah. um, uh, will ultimately achieve the, the right result. So I don't mean to be flippant, but I'm not really sure what the Trump policy is right now, okay, quite frankly. I don't know who's in charge, how this works. Trump says, you know, if you listen to his tweets, um, he says he's the one in charge of policy, and yet you've got people who are working in different ways. He undercuts his own Secretary of State. Um, so it's really hard to determine um, what they are trying to decide. There are people in the administration who know what they're doing, in the sense that they, some of them understand North Korea pretty well. Um, there's a narrative going out that this is all a tactical ploy. I don't discount that. But the only way you can find out, quite frankly, is by actually having a conversation and experimenting and hypothesis testing as to whether or not you do this. And the only way you can do that is have a conversation. And so um, I, I can also only go with what um, people have said. 
the South Korean president, uh, Moon Jae-in, has credited Donald Trump. Now, there are reports that said Donald Trump asked Moon Jae-in to give him credit, right? So I don't know what to say on that, okay? If I were him, and knowing what I know about the president, you know, giving people credit is always not a bad idea, right? Especially if you want, if they're, you know, and for, for South Korea, they're in a very difficult position, right? Um, you've got Donald Trump who has said to them, you know, uh, uh, that they're talking about unilateral strike when they know that they're, they are the most likely to suffer. When you have someone like Lindsey Graham, who's very s smart, very experienced, and I think he knows what he's talking about, when he says, we don't care about people over there, if thousands get killed over there, we don't care, that's not a great statement that you're talking about an ally. My guess is that Lindsey Graham was trying to pressure the Chinese to do something, and not ne he didn't necessarily mean it that way. But that's the way it comes off. So my, my, the short answer is, I think the uh, Trump administration policy of more pressure, more sanctions, um, makes sense. And deterrence, heavy deterrence makes sense. But the component that has been missing is conversation. If you put those three together, you may have a chance to get a deal. Go ahead. So the other night, watching the news, yeah. Lester Holt, NBC News anchor, live from North Korea at the ski resort. Yeah. You see all these North Koreans clad in fashion-forward ski wear, yep. riding one of those conveyor belt lifts yeah. up yeah. the beautiful ski mountain. And obviously, not all North Koreans are represented in this yeah. film. So my question is, what percentage of North Koreans are those ski people, and what percentage are suffering in prison camps and starving, and are these sanctions helping or hurting? Well, a very small percentage of those people have the ability to do, to go to this ski resort. And I think the general feeling is that the folks in Pyongyang, the center, are much better off than people on the periphery, unless you happen to be on the Chinese border, which there's a lot of commerce that is going on. You're pointing out something that I think is very significant that people, that is also often lost. North Korea, in my mind, is a humanitarian disaster, okay? It was a humanitarian disaster when people were dying of starvation, when there's malnutrition. Part of it is due to the North Koreans themselves. You also have people in political prisons here where um, the um, inspector uh, in the UN talked about these atrocities that are happening. And so for me, as a Korean American, we have to do something about this and let, make it, we, we can't bury it in any way because the truth will come out at some point. North Korea, as we know it, will change or cease to exist. And all the news about what happened during that period of time will come out. And I'm going to have to look at my kids and say, what did you do during this time? And I have to say, I, you know, I made sure that people understood that this was an issue. There are limited things that we can do, but we can't let it, we can't ignore it. So um, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of people that I think there's an estimate, don't hold me to it, about 200,000 who are in pr uh, political prisons, right? And again, there's, this is, there's an incredible amount of suffering going on, and that's something we can't ignore. Um, okay. Hi. Hi. You know, one of my concerns has been that this last uh, nuclear test the North Koreans did, actually thermal nuclear test underground, pretty much collapse their test facility, which means they're probably not going to be doing any underground nuclear tests for quite some time. And um, they also, the, the, the recent missile tests, they can put a missile 2,400 miles above the Earth's surface. I'm wondering if possibly there, there, there might be a concern that they would decide to do a, not an atmospheric test, but rather a space-based test where they would launch a missile and at the top of the apogee discharge the nuclear weapon. And this would be this would give them some propaganda value. It also would give them, you know, it would give them additional information on how, you know, on how their weapon performs in a in, in, in that type of an environment. Okay. Yeah. So okay, I'm not okay, it depends what you mean by some time. I, I know that the northern so the facility that they use for this latest explosion Huge collapse, right. right? So it was, um, but they have, there are four other portals. 
And so they are, from my understanding, you can see this on Google Earth, they are now excavating in another portal which they're mm -hmm. going to probably try to use. Whether that's going to be suitable or not, I do not know. Right. So yes, it'll probably be a little time before they can do another nuclear test. My guess is that they're probably going to do something that's much more about miniaturization. And what miniaturization is, you got a nuclear device which is huge, you got to make it small enough to mount on a missile so you can right. carry it. The bigger it is, the shorter the missile will go. This is what they're going to at least say that they're trying to do. I think that what we want to make sure and figure out, that's why I want to have conversations with North Korea as soon as possible, because the last thing that I want them to do is risk an open air test with a missile. Now, China did that back in the mid-1960s, yeah. mainly because the United States was skeptical that the that this Chinese were technologically capable of actually doing something like this. And, and the argument seems to be that they felt compelled to demonstrate this. So they did an open air test from one end of China to the other, and they had an, uh, um, a, a nuclear explosion, right? North Korea doesn't have that. So if they're going to do something, think about the ramifications of that. Doing it even in space, what if it doesn't blow up in space and comes back down again, right? What right. if it crashes in a different way? You don't want that to happen right. because of what, Absolutely. of the bad things, I mean, the, because of the, if it malfunctions. The other reason is that if it succeeds, that's going to cause a huge political uproar in the United States that may create a situation where no deal is possible. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm very interested in a, the talk and what would happen. It, it seems to me that the U.S. policy is the denuclearization of North Korea. That's sort of the precondition. And there's no way, as you said, that that's going to be possible. So for the U.S. to engage in some conversation, which is short of that, to cover some of these issues on the ICBMs or how testing goes on, et cetera, is the understanding and the acceptance that there is a nuclear program in North Korea. How does the United States change its approach to be able to talk if denuclearization is the bottom line? So I, so making it, a, first of all, preconditions where you're assuming the end of the negotiation doesn't make any sense. Politically, they have to say this. I think there is an in-between piece of this. And the in-between piece is over what period of time are we talking about. I also think that the longer we have waited, the worse our leverage gets. So in other words, we had an opportunity in 2000 before they did anything, and we decided not to. Quite frankly, we did the same thing with Iran. We, for a variety of reasons, we couldn't strike a deal earlier, and it festered, and the longer we waited, the less leverage that we have. So with North Korea, Realistically, they're not going to give these up over the short term, all right? But what you can do is, I believe, we should never say we accept North Korean nuclear weapons, we, and we can always declare that our goal is denuclearization. We just don't necessarily have to get agreement with North Korea because, you know, there's no conversation that's going to happen. I think what is going to happen or can happen is that the things don't get worse, you have a conversation, and then what happens is that you build on what you have with the possibility that North Korea decides that its security is, is such that at some point it decides it's willing to give up. I think what North Korea wants to do, or will do very shortly, if, is that they're going to get us X number of nuclear weapons. Let's say they say their number. They have a number in mind. Let's say it's 75. Then they'll go to the United States. OK, we have 75 nuclear weapons. You can't do anything about it. They can hit you. Let's negotiate. Let's do arms control. We're willing to give you 50. What are you going to give us for 50 nuclear weapons? But we're going to keep 25 until we believe that you're safe. And then that's going to take a period of time. And then ultimately, the hope is that they will eventually give them up. Um, but you know, that's a very long time for now. And that's the best we can do. And out of air time considerations, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. That was Philip Yun in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation produced in collaboration with 360 North. It was recorded January 24, 2018 at 360 in Juno, with support from Alaska Airlines, Alaska Electric Light and Power Company, Alaska Power and Telephone, Kerr Alaska Incorporated, GCI, Hecla Greens Creek Mining Company, Haight and Associates, The Prospector Hotel, Sea Alaska, and Wastman & Associates Incorporated.